like I said last time when we spoke, I want you to really get a revelation of, of how the Lord looks at us. Um, not how He looks at us when we're doing good things for Him, how He looks at us in general as, as, his, as his child, as His bride-to-be, as His bride, however you want to see it from whatever your understanding is of it, but how He looks at you. Because like I said last time, we've got this thing where we think we, you know, when we are not so much into the Lord at the moment or we struggling with something or there's something negative happening and we don't have much time with the Lord, then He's distancing from us. But it's, it's not the truth. He's never distanced from us. All right. Um, he understands when we go through difficult times. He understands when we don't have a lot of time for Him at the stage. There's a season that that will happen. But he, that doesn't phase him. But we get upset. We get worried that we are losing the Lord or maybe he's, he forgot about us or something like that. But he doesn't. The only thing he will do is he will miss you because you're not engaging with him maybe that much. But he's not changing his heart or his mind about you at all. So in this you will hopefully see that. And if you can remember... The last time we spoke, about the, the, when we did the first five verses of Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon's, we had a little taste of his love for us. We started with that, um, his attitude that he's, he's really longing for us to, to be in a relationship with him. And in, in Song of Songs, he explains to us how he sees this relationship, especially from his side. And then we see how the bride reacts, your soul reacts sometimes to him coming for you, to be with you. Last week we spoke and said all of this started with a kiss. You remember the last time we spoke? It all started with a kiss. And I mean, I thought a lot about this kiss thing after that again. Because I wanted to know if there's more, what is there? Because like I said to you last time, when the Lord told me that about this kiss thing, I mean, he really emphasized this kiss, that how important this thing is. I went and looked in the, in the natural to see what they say about kissing, to see is there anything there. I said, yeah, kissing causes a chemical reaction. This is now what the clever people say in your brain including a burst of the hormone oxytocin gets released when you, when, this, when you kiss. It's often referred to as the love hormone because it stirs up feelings and affections and attachment. According to a, to a 2013 study, oxytocin is particularly important in helping men bond with a partner and stay mononymous. I hmm. don't know what that is for, but yeah, it helps even with that. <laughs> Um, I said that kissing can increase arousal, they say. Um, a lot of studies, I read a couple of these things, they actually say kissing can make you feel high, as if you high. Um, they say it releases these hormones that give you a natural, a natural high. Uh, a study shows that, that um, a study that I think, I've got a name here, Helen Fisher, she did a study and she said, um, when, you, some, when people kiss, it's, it can be compared to taking like heroin, she said, and cocaine for the brain. The reaction the brain gets out of that, it's the same as those two drugs will, will give you. Um, so, yeah, it's, she said the dopamines that your brain releases. It's the same as with the, with the cocaine and the, and the hormones. So, I mean, it's just in the, in the natural see how your brain works and with a kiss. And I, when I thought about it, I thought, it's funny, a kiss is so important to the Lord that he starts this book with his bride about a kiss, so that she calls for a kiss. And it's funny, he got betrayed by a kiss. That's the thing that betrayed him. It was also a kiss. That's how intimate it is. Think on that for a second. The most intimate thing for him betrayed him. That's how he got betrayed. I don't know if, if um, I can't think of his name, what's his name, um, Judas, 
if we knew how the Lord felt about the kiss, that he used that as a betrayal. I know it was a, a manner of greeting back in those days. You will hear Paul says, I greet you with a, a brotherly kiss. Or what, uh, they, they would say that. It was a, a thing of the day. Um, but yeah, obviously the Lord specifically wanted it to be a kiss that betrayed him because of the meaning of that. It's just something to think about. I think there's even more in that than we, we realize. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was in those days the men and the, they greeted with a kiss. I think we are of the few cultures, the South African culture that's in South Africa, are the, are the last ones that still greets with a kiss. It's dying out. Um, yeah, they still greet there. Yeah, there's one or two countries that still, but your first world countries, most of them don't do that anymore. They actually frown upon it uh, if, you, if you still kiss. But yeah, it's, it's something that's, that's fading away. I said, your kiss that is done out of love will make you desire, love and honor that partner. I'm going to say it again. A kiss that is done out of love will make you desire, love and honor that partner. I said, a kiss is the door opener to your whole body. It starts with a kiss where you open up yourself to, to your partner. And it starts with a kiss. I said, people that love one another, they will give everything to one another um, by a kiss. So in this book of Song of Solomons, we want to continue to see what this, where this goes. Between the Shulamite, and remember she sees him still as the shepherd. Where is this going to go? I said in today's life we find spiritual growing in more mature believers. You start seeing that in them. You see it more and more happening, but in a very small group. But you see it happening, which years ago there wasn't a lot of that. But you see spiritual people growing, believers growing, and they allow the Holy Spirit. When that growth comes, you can see they've, when, they, when you see somebody grow, you can look, they've allowed the Holy Spirit to bring healing to certain areas in their, whatever the problems were they needed healing of. <coughs> <coughs> they've allowed the Holy Spirit to heal their souls, basically. And as when that happens, you will see the love relationship will start to form. Before that happens, it will just be a religious serving the Lord, which most believers do. They just serve the Lord. You can pray for sick, you can pray for cast out demons and all that still doesn't mean you love you can still do that stuff you don't need love for that stuff but for me when I see somebody starting to grow spiritually is when they allow the Holy Spirit to bring healing to them in areas where it's desperately needed so the soul gets cleansed, healed and the relationship starts to, to blossom out of that and it's very important. So if you want to grow and you've got an area that still needs healing, allow the Holy Spirit to come there and when He heals, your relationship will grow, will thrive actually. I said, yeah, these growing Christians, they have one desire, and that is Christ. Um, they see Him as a spiritual groom. Uh, they, they, they hunger for Him. I said, yeah, they grow out of their baby, toddler, teenager stadiums. Understand what I'm saying? These people that's allowing the Holy Spirit to cleanse their soul, which are growing, they, are, they went through their baby, teenager, and toddler seasons. They've grown. You will see they've grown through that. I said they've moved out of the house to be on their own. All right, so they were in the natural state with their parents, grew grew baby, teenager, grown more, and then they moved out of the house. Why move out of the house? Because when you're independent, you grow faster than being with parents in the same house. It's just, it's just the way it is. All right, so as soon as you see that move happens, growth will happen. And in the spirit, it's the same. There's these people that, um, that have grown and they've moved out of that house. They've grown to be on their own with the Lord. 
and now you will see growth happen in their spiritual life. I said it can be seen as leaving your mother and father's home when you go into your own place. Because as soon as you're on your own, the responsibilities become yours. It's not now the parents anymore. You have to pay the bills. There's a responsibility that comes. You have to pay the rent, the water, buy food. You have to plan. It becomes a responsibility and you have to stand up for that responsibility. Otherwise, you're going to sink. And it's the same spiritually. Um, it can also mean when you move out of religious systems. You were in a religious system. You've stepped up, stepped out of that system and grown. Because you're not playing there anymore or busy with this anymore. You've stepped up, stepped out of it, and growth will f uh, start to follow. Remember, we said it last time, he's after your soul. And all these things is what your soul needs to grow. If your soul doesn't have these things, it will struggle to grow. But he's after your th soul, and our souls should thirst after him. It should both ways. Remember this this lady, the Shulamite lady is calling out to him also. She's also got a desire for him. And then sometimes she, you will see she, she pulls away. But she's still got that desire. But the flesh comes in, she pulls away from him again. Um, but here you must see in this story, he never pulls away. This king has basically lost his heart to this Shulamite. He's fully in love, fully sold out to her, even though she will pull away and say things about herself. That's not what he's doing. So what must we do? I said here, yeah, Psalm 45, verse 11 and 12. Then the king will be attracted by your beauty. After all, he is your master. Submit to him. Rich people from Tyre will seek your favor by bringing a gift. What must we do with this, this king, this bridegroom that's so hunger for our love, so hunger for desires us so much, is this. All you need to do is to submit to him. And in today's life, isn't that the thing that everybody fights about? Nobody wants to submit. Women don't want to submit to a man anymore. And I'm talking about the good way of doing it, not the wrong way of doing it. Feminism is pushing, we don't need a man. Again, everything opposite of what the Bible is saying. And yes, there were men that used and abused that thing in totally the wrong way. Again, I'm saying this again for you women out there. What does the Bible say about a woman? What, let me put it this way. What does, a, what does God say about a woman? Uh, in his creation. Yeah. Equal to Adam. God said, I've given this to Adam and Eve, and they must rule it together. He hasn't got more say or anything like that. They have equal say. Most of the stuff that came in about women not doing this and that came through the Jewish culture. Not through God. God said equal. He says in the beginning of the book. Right, and then we, through cultures and understandings, made it even worse than what the Jews actually did. All right, but they've got both. I, I, I still believe, and I will still say this, I will get stoned for saying this, I don't believe a woman must be in, in um, spiritually uh, leading. And I've got a reason why I say that, because you lead out of emotions, and that's not a good thing to do. Always, emotions are used for something else, not for leading, leadership. But can you teach and preach and do all this stuff? For sure. But the church shunned that out. I just don't see a woman as a leader. You know, in the leading a group. You won't find it in the Bible also, uh, uh, standing up. But can they be in a leadership position with a man? For sure. They can do everything a man can do. You understand what I'm saying? It's not like the... the the world is saying, or the church system is saying, go home. You've heard that thing. Most denominations are saying, if a woman preaches, they, say, they will say, go home. Because there's a verse in the Bible that says that. I don't believe that. That's wrong. God says equal. All right? But we must submit. We must submit. We must submit. Why must we submit? Because our souls are female. 
and we must submit to him which is the male, the dominant figure. Because her husband will stand in front, a woman mustn't stand in front because her husband must take the knocks. Not the woman. She mustn't take the knocks. She must protect the one that's taking the knocks, standing in front. So we must submit. I said this, when two people truly love one another, silence is not a threat to them. I'm going to say it again. When two people truly love one another, silence is not a threat to them. I mean, we all know when you speak to people and there comes that awkward silence. Now you think, what must I do to get out of this awkward silence? But when you're with somebody that you love and you know and you've been with them for years, you know one another, it doesn't become awkward anymore. You don't have to prove yourself or do things or say things. All right. But let's continue in verse 6. Where the Shulamite is speaking. She's speaking here. Look not upon me, because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of their vineyards, but mine own vineyards have I not kept. Tell me, O thou whom my soul love, where thou feeds, where thou makes thy flock to rest at noon. For why should I be as one that turneth aside by the flocks of my companions? It's a difficult verse that is to read it like that, it does, because there's a lot of imagery in there. That's why I put that image on the group with the head. And everybody asks me, oh, we're not talking about the Shulamite anymore. You are not the only one. I put that there for a reason, because it's saying something, that image. Because that area that that image shows that needs cleaning is the most difficult thing to clean. Because it's so full of religious things and we don't understand what's being said here. Your brain is the most difficult thing to clean. If you cannot let your brain be cleaned by the Holy Spirit, you will not understand spiritual stuff. You will stay stuck in your religious, your religious stuff and your religious beliefs. You, would, you see, I put a video, I think it was this week, I put that video on, I can't remember. Where I said, it's always funny, when we say something that we believe, we get attacked. But we never attack other people that believe different from us. Why is that? Have you noticed that? Even in the world, the people that are standing for good are always getting attacked. But they don't attack the other ones that's doing bad. But they are always getting attacked. And in this, I've seen over the years, when we say what we believe and what we see in the Bible, people want to attack us. They get actually aggressive, evil, aggressive with us, believers. But we never attack them, never go and say, hey, what you believe is wrong and you, we never go into that conversation, but they will, they're more than willing to come with you, to you and tell you that you're wrong and want to fight with you. Uh, it's, it's actually evil, the way people think, and it, it shows you where the root of that thing comes from, what they believe, that they would act that way and become aggressive with people that's believers like them, but just because you don't believe like they do, they become extremely aggressive. It's because they've never allowed their their hard drives to be formatted. That's why they are struggling and stuck with that thing. I said in that one teaching, I said, how can you believe in something if you have never heard the opposite of that thing? How can you know it's the truth? And in Christianity, you're basically putting your life on that. You're not going to go to hell because of it, but it's got a heck of an influence in your life. You look at every cult religious cult that was ever there. What was their focus on? End times coming back, Armageddon, all of those things are on all those cults. And what is it, the drive factor behind it? That fear for that thing. But if people still believe in that thing today. And they will fight you because you don't believe in that thing. And we're not supposed to fight. But you must come at a place where you allow the Holy Spirit to to cleanse, to say, listen, I believe this, come show me. and Take away what needs to be taken away. I'm willing to allow you to take away what that needs to be taken away in my brain. The stuff that I've stored there that might not be so pure and true than what you're actually saying to me now. And then when you read a verse like this, you're going to struggle to understand it. I said to you, the Hebrew in this literally means... Where she says, I'm black, means many mornings, suns have darkened me. 
That's what the, the Hebrew word is actually saying in that thing. She, and here you see what she's doing. The Shulamite speaking here, she's finding fault in herself again. She's looking at herself and not knowing her identity, truly knowing it yet. She's finding fault with herself. And I mean, we personally, as believers, we, we tend to see the darkness. We spoke about the last time too. We tend to see the darkness in ourselves very clearly. And we focus on that. We all do that. We see the things that's wrong in ourselves. And we struggle with it sometimes. Um, we struggle to believe that he can feel that way about us if we know about these dark spots, black spots in our soul that's still there or that we did in the past. We don't want to believe we covered it with the blood. We still see the, the darkness under the blood and we still focus on that. But he doesn't. But we very easily see that. If you look at how she's writing here, I just added this. If you look at what she's writing here, what she's saying about the flock and looking after it and all that, she's got a typical female character here. She's portraying a typical female character of a woman, a mother here. In, in why I'm saying that um, she would rather help others and she will have le um, less. And remember, this is one of the most beautiful things God placed in a woman. Look at a mother. She would rather buy clothes and food for the child and have nothing and stand back. It's something that you women's got. We men don't have that actually. We can think we have it, but we don't have it that way. You've got a special way. And you can see she's doing that way. She's saying this. Where you will, you will put your child first above everything and, and if, if it means you are not going to get anything, it's okay with you. All right? Sometimes women tend to overdo that and then they want to help everybody when they should not help everybody. Then they are going again overboard on the other side because of the emotion. But there is something beautiful there that the Lord placed that a, a female will always help even though it will cost them more in that help. It will come at a cost for them. But they are still willing, they will do it. And that's what she's saying here also. She's asking her a question, where do you feed your flock? Where do you lead your beloved ones, the sheep? She's asking him these things now. Where, where? And why do you think she's asking that? Because she wants to go there where he is. She doesn't want to go anywhere else. All right, she wants to go where he is. Then verse 8, we have the shepherd speaking in verse 8. If thou know not, how thou hast fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock, and feed thy kids, the little female goats and lambs, beside the shepherd's tents. This translation, listen my radiant one, if you ever lose sight of me, just follow in my footsteps where I lead my lovers. Come with your burdens and cares, come to the place near the sanctuary of my shepherds, there you will find me. See how he's calling her, telling her where to go? He's leading her to where? To where he is. And in this thing you can see, he sees her beauty. Inside and out. He's, it's all he's looking at is, is her beauty. Your beauty. How he made you, the, the, how he made your soul. The thing that he's in love with. Please, guys, you are not a disappointment for him. A lot of us... Again, females tend to do this again a bit more. You always feel not worthy for the Lord because your emotions of things you've done wrong comes up and it, it, it attacks you and accuses you and it's, it's not true. You are not a disappointment to Him. Nothing, nothing, nothing is too difficult for the Lord to heal. He can heal anything if we allow Him. Anything. Like I said last time, just with a kiss, he takes away everything. Verse 9. I have compared thee, O oh, my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariot. Amen. Imagine you say that to your wife. <laughs> huh? Oh, my love. I compare you to a company of horses that pulls a chariot. Huh? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Uh, my dearest one, let me tell you how I see you. You are so thrilling to me. To gaze upon you is like looking at one of Pharaoh's finest horses, a strong regal steed pulling his royal chariot. Why is he going with the horses here? See how he starts this sentence. Remember she just said, 
I'm dark, uh, you know, I don't look so good, I've got issues, but I want you, but I've got issues. His response is, if you look here, my dearest one. Look how he approaches. He doesn't talk about the stuff she just mentioned that's dark and bitter and wrong. He goes and calls her. He says here, let, um, you know, when he sees her, you are thrilling to me. He, he, he enjoys looking at her when he sees her. He, she brings him joy. Your soul, when he looks at you, brings him joy. I mean, think about that for a second. When we look at the black spots, and he doesn't. He looks at, at her and sees this beauty. And he says here, the gaze upon is like looking at one of Pharaoh's finest horses. A strong regal steed. So, what does this all mean? I went and looked a bit into this. Solomon and those guys got their horses from Egypt. They used the Egyptian breed of horses. They called it the best of the best back then. And I still today, Egyptian horses are seen as, as good horses. Have you seen how Egyptian horse looks? It looks a bit different. His face is a bit... Funnier. It's got a funny pointy face, the Egyptian horses. Uh, but it, back then, those were the horses to have. So Pharaoh and those guys went and only bought those horses, the best of the best horses, to pull their chariots. So the best horses were taken out of and only given to Pharaoh to pull his, his chariot. So what is that saying to us? The Lord is saying to you and me, you are the finest, the best of all. You, that horse, are the finest, the best. He's chosen you specifically because you're the best to bring him in one day. He's chariot him in one day. But he's chosen you to do that. You are the chosen horse, that Egyptian thoroughbred horse that were so seeked in those times. There were lots of horses in those times there, but they had to go get an Egyptian horse. That's the ones that they used. Solomon, I mean, Solomon only used those horses also. And I mean, they had lots of other horses. And that's how he seeks you out to go and see you, that he wants you to bring him in. Um, I said, yeah, a war horse like these were used for, were special. It was a special kind of horse that needed to do that. Why? A war horse had no fear. You can't have the character of a donkey when it comes to a war. Again, there's a different thing that needs to be done there. There you have to have the character of a war horse here. Because, I mean, when a war horse challenge and, and comes in and they charge, I mean, people get shot to pieces, horses get shot to pieces, killed. But they don't stop. Have you ever seen a horse? They will not stop. They will charge. The ones they used in war. People will be dying. Bombers will be falling. They will charge. They have no fear of horse. That's what he sees in you. No fear. That takes a special type of person. But that's what he sees you are capable of doing for him. I said to you, the meaning of horses in your Bible can be a picture of royalty, position, strength, warrior, and godly pride. A horse can also in the negative talk about pride, negative pride. You can get at people that's got the negative pride of a horse uh, because a horse can be very pride, proud of his horse, a pride animal. But it can be in the negative cycle. But those are the positive things about a horse. A chariot can be a throne, a nation, or a kingdom. That's what he said spiritually to you. You are that horse, that Egyptian thoroughbred. You must bring in his throne one day. His nation, kingdom, his dominion, in other words. His kingdom must come through you. You must bring it in one day. And he trusts you with that. He chose you, like that horse was chosen, the Egyptian horses were chosen. He chose you to bring that in one day. I said to Jesus, paid the ultimate price so we could walk in this victory. 
We must just believe it, that we can walk in this. Verse 10. Thy cheeks are comely, comely with rows of jewels, thy neck with chains of gold. Your tender cheeks are aglow. Your earrings and gem landed necklace set them ablaze. Cheeks. What is cheeks a type of? It speaks of your emotions. Cheeks has got to do with emotions. Sad, happy. You can see that in somebody's face. The way they pull their face, their cheeks. Anger. Look when somebody's angry, how they pull their face. I mean, we've got that, what, that thing that they say. Um, they say that your face can speak a thousand words without saying anything. If you just look at somebody's face. And the cheeks speaks, I mean, cheeks, the main thing that I would always say about cheeks is when somebody blushes, where does it show? On the cheeks. And blushing speaks of mostly innocence. When somebody blushes, it's to do with innocence, purity, shyness, soft-hearted nature. When the cheek blushes, when he looks at the cheek. So what does it mean for us today? If he's saying this, thy cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, thy neck. He's saying to you, your emotional life is beautiful to me. Those cheeks. You are radiant. Why? Because he sees you as purity, innocence. Because he made you pure and innocent at the cross. That's what he sees in you. Your cheeks give it away. Verse 11. We will make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. We will enhance the beauty with golden ornaments studded with silver. This we... He speaks about, yeah, I believe, he's speaking, uh, I've looked at that, what other people say, speaks about the Trinity, if you want to call it the Trinity, I don't want to go if you believe in Trinity or not, but it's, the Father plays a role in your relationship, the Holy Spirit plays a role in your relationship, Jesus, the, your bridegroom, plays a role in your relationship, in growing, they all have a, um, a role they play in your growth as a believer. We know gold speaks of purity, godliness, silver speaks of redemption. We've done that on previous teachings, so I'm not going into that now. But redemption, purity, he's bringing you that purity out, the gold. That's why in, in the book of Revelations we have golden streets. It speaks of the, 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 the path he laid, the impurity, those streets are Jesus. It's not literal streets. It's Jesus they're talking about there. It's not a true street. I can remember I would listen to a teaching where the guy said, you know, one day when the believers come in heaven, they're going to take a, a hammer and a chisel and chisel out all, this, all the gold out of the road because they want the gold. Huh? Because, I mean, he's making fun of something that people believe. There's a lot of churches believe we're going to have a city with those golden streets. It's not what it's saying. So much more and more beautiful. Verse 12, the Shulamite is speaking again. Remember, he was speaking now, the shepherd. Now the Shulamite is speaking. She's speaking, the bride, you. While the king sitteth at his table, my spike knot sendeth forth the smell thereof. As the king surrounds me, the sweet fragrance of my praises perfume awaken the night. Spike knot. We've done this when we did the tabernacle. Is the essential oil made of the spike knot plant? I don't know if you can remember, we did that in the tabernacle way in the beginning. There is it, the spike knot. It bleeds that oil out of it. It's, it's expensive oil also. That's a spike knot. We did a whole teaching on that when we did the tabernacle where they got it and how it worked and all that. Right, verse 13. A bundle of mirror is my well beloved unto me. He shall lie all night between my breasts. Song of Songs say, A sachet of mirror is my lover, like a tied up bundle of mirror resting over my heart. I know Miani did a, a teaching on that. 
I think it's just when we I got there in the beginning. I can't remember quite when it was. Uh, this about this. He called it the bossy mirror. This is the board the bossy mirror. Um, I and mean, again, this is not a sexual thing. This, this is something beautiful it's saying here. Mirror. It's a picture of suffering love. Because it bleeds that plant. It suffers to get that oil out. The mirror plant. It speaks about the cross. Where he suffered and bled out for us. The suffering love of Jesus. That's what the mirror is about. It's one of the things it speaks about. There's more, but... In this sense, is what is going here. Um, I said to you, you cannot love and not suffer. Think of what I'm saying. You cannot love and not suffer. It costs a price. I said to you, there is a cost for us because we love Jesus. It costs a price to be a lover of Jesus. Again, I don't want to make other people sound bad or anything, but in most religious circles, most people do not love. So if you go to those places, unfortunately, and you're in love with him, and you share your love with him, you show your emotions for him, you're weird. They don't want to talk to you. They see you as wrong. I mean, in most churches, if men cry, people frown upon that. Because they don't know that. They've never seen that, that they've truly fallen in love with somebody. It, it's, it's a difficult thing to explain to them to see why. But it, for you as a believer, it will cost a price. You cannot go and tell everybody who you love and how much you love them. Because people will frown upon that. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that means you haven't been in a religious circle where you will see that happen. Even in family, go look at your family and tell them how much you love Jesus and show them how much you love Jesus and see what they say about you behind your back. It costs a price if you are a true lover. If you want to talk with the religious people, they will not think weirdly of you. But tell them you love Jesus and how you love Jesus. You will be frowned upon, unfortunately. And again, rather walk away. Don't con don't don't. Don't try and fight that. Say, do not understand. But that's why I'm saying, to love Jesus, it costs a price. You pay a price for that. Note where this mirror is located. Where is this mirror located? What's between the breasts? The heart. The heart. Where in the tabernacle of Moses would that be? You all went through that. Altar of incense. Remember we did a whole teaching of that. The altar of incense. Where you, when you go and lie down there, it's a place for prayer. And when you lie down there, those five spices, which were there, that, that will come and sit upon you and you will smell like him because you heard his heartbeat. You were lying at his heart and you will start to smell like him. And you must lie there before you can go into the Holies of holies. Because where the heart is, is where the altar of incense is. That's where this mirror is lying. The suffering, that's, that's where it's lying here. And this odor that comes from the spice must come on you. I mean, mirror was the first spice we mentioned. It's in Exodus 30 verse 23. You can go read it there if you don't know where it is. Where it talks about the mirror. It's the first spice that was poured onto that altar, prayer altar. And then you smell like him because it's where his heart is. You need to smell like him to go into the love room, into the next room. I said, yeah, we need to smell like the mirror before we can be intimate with him. In the King James, it speaks about the breasts. What does that mean? It speaks of faith, love, insight. Discipline, maturity, nurturing, and food. Breasts. I said, yeah, when we are at the place of maturity, of, of love and, and that maturity, we are being nurtured. And when we are nurtured, 
Our heads will be on his heart when we allow him. Hearing his heartbeat. He wants to nurture us so that we can hear his heartbeat. That our heartbeat become his. That we smell like the mirror. Because what does this thing that burns do? That smell comes and sits on you. If you bry, what does it smell like after the bry? You smell like the bry. Huh? I hate that smell. I love brying, but I hate that smell on me afterwards. I need to go take a shower immediately. I don't want to smell like meat the whole time afterwards. Because that smoke comes and sits in your clothes, in your hair. And that's what it's talking about here, because that was smoke coming up. And it went to sit on you. All right. Verse 14. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. Engedi, fountain of the kid, fountain of the goat, fountain of the lamb. That's what it means. Campfire speaks of to cover no redemption price. It's a henna plant. Some translation you will see they will write the henna plant. And it was used for dyeing, covering clothes, coloring it. So it's a covering you're receiving. It speaks of this cover, this redemption price that was paid for you, that you are covered in. We're not going to go further than this. So tonight, let's take it together. We start off again with her saying she's not worthy. She's got blackness, the sun burned her. She doesn't look that good, in other words, she's saying. And he says, come, I will show you, follow me, come to me. And he calls her these beautiful things that he calls her. And then when he speaks, he tells her where he sees her, how he sees her. Nurturing her, bringing her to his heart, that she can hear his heart. Where she was putting away, he's calling her in again. See how gentle he does that. He doesn't force her to him. He gently calls her every time, my beloved, come here. My beloved, my cherished one, my beauty. See how he uses his love language to call and draw her in to come and lie here on his heart where he can nurture her. That's what, he's, what it's for him is all about. And he's using all these types and images like an Egyptian horse to say how she is the best of the best to do what he wants to be done. She's the best of the best in, in the oils that are used. Why did the women carry mirror here back in those days? That were, what were they for them? Yeah, that was their perfume. So that it would smell nice for the men. That they would smell nice. Men... Have you walked in a shop and a random lady just walks past you? You don't even see her, but what do you pick up when she goes past? That perfume. Sometimes you actually go, wow, that was maybe too much, or wow, it smells nice. You pick up that. And what does a guy do when he smells a perfume? He immediately looks, who had that perfume on? <laughs> That's the effect perfume had on men. Huh? Come on, guys. Am I talking the truth? That's the effect perfume has on you. That sense has got to, there's something that it triggers. That's why the woman wore that there. All right? So ladies smell nice. Men like that. Here he's saying he likes it. The groom, the shepherd, the king is saying he likes it. Because he's saying something to him about her beauty inside and outside that he sees in her. And he's calling that out. Um, I said, yeah, just to end it all off, I said, God is love. We all know that. God is love. But I want you to remember this love is not just an emotion. It's his nature. That God is love is not just the emotion that we sometimes think he feels this for us. He does. But it's more than that even. It's his whole nature, is love. He's got, he's got other things also, but that's what it's about. He can get angry. But even in his anger, it's because he loves. Because that's his nature. 
that he loves. I mean, if you look at Jesus when he walked the earth, even the times when he got very angry, when he did things that were angry, but if you look around that thing, you would see it's all done in the utmost love. I, I listen to the Bible this often, and there's one verse just hit me. I think it's in Romans. But it just where it says, and we all maybe heard this verse, but where it says, He died for us when we were still sinners. Now we all heard that verse, but have you thought about that verse? It's easy for a father to say, I will die for my wife or my child. Somebody comes in the house, breaks in the house, a father will give his life for them. It's easy. Yeah, we'll do it. Automatically, they won't even think about it. A mother will give her life for a child. When a mother's in labor and they say, choose, the mother will always say, take me, save the child. But that scripture says, he gave his life when we were still sinners. So if a, if a, if a guy comes in your house, rapes your wife, rapes your child, and you says, I will die for him, will you? That's what he did. That's what that verse is saying in the Bible. He died for us while we were still sinners. He didn't die when you were saved, born again Christian. Now he died for you because you look better now, because your sins are washed away. He died for you when you were still a sinner. And he said, I will die that. That's love. We sometimes think it's so, you know, love because we will gladly give our life for or somebody that we love. But that's not what he did. He didn't give his life for somebody that he loved. He gave his life for you when you were still evil, a sinner. Without knowing you will come to him. Think about that next time when you read that verse. How, what he died for. Go picture, go look at the people outside, the evil. That's what he died for. He didn't die for the ones that love him. He died for the ones that don't love him yet, that actually hates him. He said, I will die for them. That's true love. That puts a bar but high. We can't even get close to it. But that's what love is, the love that he's got. That's why I say it's his whole nature, is love. That he will die for something that doesn't even love him, that will actually reject him, hate him. But he will die for that. It makes us just think a bit differently about what that verse actually is saying. 